Hello, my name is Professor Yolanda Moses. I'm a professor of anthropology and recent vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion at the University of California, Riverside. I have the pleasure of having been the first Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Cultural Competence at the National Center for Cultural Competence here at the University of Sydney from January through June 2017. I also have the honor of being a part of the NCCC team that has developed this very important leadership retreat. I am giving this part of the workshop by video as I will be back in the U.S. when the actual workshop takes place. But this talk will be on the NCCC website, and a written version of this talk will be available there as well. My reason for applying to be a Fulbright Fellow and Distinguished Chair at the NCCC at the University of Sydney was that I was interested in the idea and the implementation of an all-university strategy around diversity, inclusion, and cultural competence diversity and inclusion initiatives on university campuses in the U.S. have been occurring since the 1970s, but have had various degrees of success in achieving their goals. Australian universities have been pursuing similar agendas for at least the same amount of time. Those of us who research diversity and culture change in higher education in the U.S. and elsewhere know that diversity programs alone are not enough to guarantee institutional transformation and sustainability around the values of inclusion, excellence, and authentic engagement that embracing diversity could offer both in the U.S. and in Australia. I wanted to know more about the all-institutional model here at the University of Sydney and whether it had the potential to shift institutional culture over time. That would be of interest to you, but to those of us around the world who are grappling with institutional and organizational change around diversity and inclusion, it would be of interest to us as well. So what is the role of leadership in an all-institutional approach to diversity and inclusion? As I've written elsewhere, I have followed the diversity movement in higher education in the United States and elsewhere for more than 30 years. In the United States, we have reached a crossroads as it relates to diversity. I see institutional types and their relationship to diversity in three different categories. The first category is where institutions talk about diversity and inclusion in their catalogs and brochures, but they do not necessarily link those words to institutional practices. In the second stage, institutions are those that have many diversity and inclusion programs across campus, often working in isolation from each other. It is what I call random acts of diversity and inclusion. There seems to be a lot going on but it is not clear what the institutional value of these activities are or how they relate to the overall goals of the institution. Stage three is what I call aspirational diversity. These are institutions that are in the process of making the shift to complete institutional transformation. The University of Sydney appears to be an institution that is making that shift. What would such a shift look like? Well, even before finding the University of Sydney whole university model, I had come up with some criteria of what a stage three institution would look like. Here they are. First, an institution that is willing to undergo a paradigm shift that would include a comprehensive institutional change strategy that involves rethinking and reformulating what it means to treat diversity and cultural competence as core institutional commitments. Second, this requires articulating a clear link between the value of diversity and inclusion and the mission of the institution and putting that commitment to practice 
at all levels. Third, in such a model, our institutional missions of research, teaching, and service would be looked at through a critical framework. In other words, the status quo will not get us where we want to be. We would ask the critical questions of research for what and for whom, whose lives are being made better. Fourth, we would ask, is our teaching focused on who our students are and how do they learn, and are we equipped to help them with their own learning outcomes? Fifth, is the service we provide to our communities and stakeholders for all of those in our communities or just some? A shift to this frame means that the roles of research, teaching, and service are then organically tied to the needs of all the people, especially the vulnerable ones of our students and staff who attend our universities and to the critical issues that affect vulnerable people in civil society. Issues such as a more nuanced public understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights here in Australia the volatility behind migration and immigration issues here in Australia and in the US, and the very recent abolishing of 457 visas and the significant new constraints on temporary interest visas, both in the United States and Australia. Where is this work being done in stage three? There was no one institution in the U.S. that was doing what I call stage three diversity and inclusion work. There were some doing stage two work, including my own. In Australia, there are stage one and stage two universities, but the University of Sydney ticked all of the boxes for me, and this is where I wanted to come. What is the University of Sydney's commitment to diversity and inclusion, and what is the role of leadership? Cultural competence has been stated as a major priority in your 2016 to 20 strategy. As you strive to make Sydney a truly inclusive, culturally diverse, and distinctly Australian university where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are part of that identity. What makes this unique? Your vice chancellor, Dr. Michael Spence, embodies the sentiment in the words, in your 2016-20 strategic plan when he says, the University of Sydney promotes a vision of a university with a set of core values that will shape how you relate to each other within the institution, as well as how you relate to those communities outside of the university, the external world. In the strategic plan, you all say, Quote, inclusion and diversity is a value given explicit emphasis in our statement of purpose in its affirmation that we should be a community for people from a wide variety of social and cultural backgrounds. You go on to say that an institution marked by the diversity of many different kinds is a stronger institution, more likely to achieve its ambition of excellence. The focus here is a commitment that every person in the university has a commitment to make and should be valued and empowered to make that contribution. The document goes on to say that this section on cultural values has been one of the most difficult sections to flesh out because culture change is an ongoing process that will require the participation of the whole university community and will take time to achieve. One of the major steps to begin this social change is a focus on developing leaders and leadership at all levels of the university. This is based on feedback from all of you. On leadership, the plan says, we are committed to a series of actions to strengthen the skills of staff in formal leadership positions, and in particular, to develop their capacity as agents of cultural change. 
This three-day leadership retreat is one of those commitments that is being fulfilled as a part of a larger ongoing set of commitments to provide both established and emerging leaders opportunities to develop their skills and capability through training, workplace projects, coaching, and other types of support. It is my understanding from Professor Juanita Sherwood, the academic director of the NCCC, that this will be the first in a series of activities to eventually build a community of practice around institutionalizing these learnings into your everyday leadership practices. The hope is that eventually you all will become culturally competent leaders, able to help the institution assess leadership performance around the values of diversity and inclusion through the lens of culturally competent leadership. This leads to your question, I am sure, just what is cultural competence and how is it relevant to me and my role on campus? The center establishes the University of Sydney as one of the first universities in the world to address cultural competence at a whole university level. This will be an aspirational process, a journey of cultural shifts and cultural change that your senior leaders support, but they know can only be a reality if you become the next group of leaders to embrace these strategies. For example, what does it mean to each of you to envision what it would mean to be a faculty, a department, or a program that uses the practices of cultural competency to achieve its goals? That is one of the major issues you will be exploring during the time you are here at the retreat. What is cultural competency? For the purposes of our work together here at the retreat, cultural competence is the ability to participate ethically and effectively in personal and professional intercultural settings. It requires being aware of one's own cultural values and worldview and their implications for making respectful, reflective, and reason choices, including the capacity to imagine and collaborate across cultural boundaries. Cultural competence is ultimately about valuing diversity for the richness and creativity it brings to society. This perspective is invaluable in your leadership role in the university, for it is through you that you model the ways of knowing, being, and doing that will inspire those you lead. This inspiration will come not by what you say, but by what you do. The work that the NCCC has planned for you these next few days will begin to build and strengthen those skills for each of you. The National Center for Cultural Competence Leadership Retreat will help you begin to reflect on, develop, and integrate cultural competence strategies that will ultimately help you create and improve upon innovative learning, teaching, research, management, and engagement initiatives. NCCC staff will introduce these strategies first from the standpoint of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. As Vice Chancellor Spence told me in a recent conversation and states more succinctly in the Wingaramura Bungabara Bagu, the University of Sydney Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Integrated Strategy Document, quote, it establishes a vision for the University of Sydney as a uniquely Australian institution, one that is shaped by and helps shape our national story and identity. 
it helps us to appreciate the richness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and cultures as a part of that story and identity. He also told me that he sees this strategy of focusing on Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander wisdom and knowledge as a starting point for our understanding of cultural competence. However, the framework of transformational leadership that is created will be expanded to embrace the other forms of cultural diversity of the university, our region, and the wider international community. So, I will invite you to join our journey as we work to build culturally competent leadership within the wider community. I certainly am a learner on that journey as well. Thank you so much for your time, and I will hand the program over to Professor Juanita Sherwood, Academic Director of the National Center for Cultural Competence.